What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, what's going on with electric vehicles? Then we'll quickly just jump into the finance segment um, with oil falling about 1%. I will cover what that means um, for the bro, uh, overall markets. And then we have Apache announcing $700 million in asset sales to wildfire energy, a mix between um, some non-operated um, Eagle, or excuse me, some Eagleford and Austin chalk assets and some Midland Basin minerals. Um, and then we will quickly cover the Phillips 66 acquiring Pinnacle Midstream in you know, uh, a, a, a midstream deal that we don't necessarily see too much. I will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner rocking a solo show today. Stu is out on assignment. He will be back in the chair tomorrow with me to round out the deck. Let's go ahead and kick this off here, guys. What's going on with electric vehicles? I'm going to read straight from the article here. 2024 has not been kind to the electric vehicle market, particularly in the United States. Sales are down. Tesla has laid off staff and EVs have been caught in the political crosshairs. The future of transportation may still be electric, but the recent struggles underscore the market's role in determining that future. This this article goes on uh, to highlight, one, that Yahoo Finance poll uh, that we talked about yesterday. They found 50% of respondents were unlikely to purchase an EV. They also talk about another Gallup poll that was actually in March of 2023. They found 41% of adults would not purchase an EV, while only 43% might consider opposition among Republicans is also much stronger, 76%, according to that Yahoo poll, and 71%, according to that Gallup poll, responded they would not buy an EV. There's, There's two things that are happening right now. First, it's just the overall cost assessment. Right now, it's becoming it's it's not economical for these companies or not, and not for the companies per se, but for consumers to actually purchase these EVs. Um, there, there was a Department of Energy study that was done by their national laboratory out in Chicago. Uh, they did this quote unquote cost assessment of purchasing. And now I'm going to start reading straight from the article: purchasing and operating electric vehicles compared to hybrid and gas powered cars. The authors found that compact cars, mid sized cars, and SUVs were cheaper than the lowest cost comparable. EV, even if owned for 15 years, even including um, some upgraded technology, uh, technological innovations and cheaper commodity prices could make EVs uh, make EVs owning or owning EVs more economical. But the upfront cost down is critical. Of course, the upfront cost is going to be key. Anything. They also point out that beyond the economics, both politics and policies are 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 kind of affecting it we talked about the tariffs that 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 joe biden has has just implemented now he also he's following up on what trump has done which was you know massive tariffs and stuff coming in from china that's not going to make products here at home cheaper unfortunately because a lot of the cheap uh products that we're getting do come from overseas so you're beginning to see a little bit of a uh, look over here we love cheap stuff oh but we also want to make sure that um we we don't take too much and we don't enrich china people you know this article also points out that the ev tax credits aren't necessarily quote unquote equitable not a big fan of that term but they point out that three that households making three hundred thousand dollars annually can still qualify for this 750 fifty dollar tax credit um basically that means it just goes to people that don't need the tax credit if there's any people that need tax credits it's the lower cost people um you know I also love this quote here because of price thresholds and domestic content requirements, only 22 of the 110 EV models sold in the U S qualify for the tax credit. So even if you want to use the tax credit, there's only about less than 20% of all EVs on the market actually qualify for the tax credit, which is absolutely unbelievable. It goes to show you that, you know, at the end of the day, the consumer will reign and EVs are getting pitched. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. As we've said on this show many times, I am for hybrids. I think hybrids are going to be the future where you have a combination of a combustion engine along with backup battery storage. I think that's also where personal consumption will go. So we will be following that 
quickly. Before I jump over and start covering some of the finance stuff, guys, we got to pay the bills around here as always. Thanks for checking us out on the world's greatest website, www.energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis that you are hearing is brought to you by that website. Um, Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can go ahead and hit that description below. Uh, links to all the articles that we cover here and check out all of our other great resources. But let's move over um, into the overall markets, guys. S&P 500 actually up about a quarter of a percentage point. NASDAQ up about the same amount, a little less than a quarter of a percentage point. Uh, Two-year yields flat, 10-year yields fall uh, about half of, uh, about a little less than a tenth of a percentage point. Dollar index extremely flat. Bitcoin drops two percentage points, uh, slightly below 70,000 after last night. It, it, it kind of um, careened over there. Um, crude oil down about a a little less than a percent, 78.66. Brent oil basically flat, down about a tenth of a percentage point, 82.74. Natural gas takes a 3% tumble, $2.67. You know, a, a couple reasons, you know, oil price falling mainly off the back of what we saw was a build. Um, if we go and throw this image up, Miss Producer, um, the EIA um, or, or the uh, crude oil inventory estimates from the API come in. We're talking about a 2.1. Four eight million barrel build being estimated. So a lot of that um, uh, price action towards the latter half of the the, the trading session was due to that. Um, we also are seeing um, we are going to wait from the 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 the. the the last policy meeting, uh, we're going to get the minutes from the Fed um, that are due to, as you listen to this on Wednesday, along with the crude oil inventory numbers out of the API. Um, Tim Schneider, we love him over at Matador Economics. There's nothing in this market right now that is pushing prices higher. If we see a little bit of stock draw tomorrow, that may help push prices back into the 7850 to $80 per barrel range. Again, it's going to be interesting. We had two Fed uh, reserve policymakers say on Tuesday that it was, quote, prudent for the U.S. bank uh, to wait several more months to ensure inflation is really back on its path to 2% target before commencing interest rate cuts. Um, we also did see comments from Christine Lagarde. She's the European Central Bank president that said she's, quote, really confident that Eurozone inflation is under control. <laughs> I mean, yeah, who knows about that? Um, some of the geopolitical risk going on between uh, Israel and Gaza right now as, you know, that quote unquote risk premium is 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 not necessarily affecting much. You know, another interesting thing is, you know, the market was also largely unaffected by the death of Iranian President um, Ibrahim Rasabi, who's basically a, a hardliner and was the the potential successor to the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, uh, so going to be very interesting, obviously, you know, kind of the second in command over there, very interesting political structure over there in the Iran. Luckily, you know, the, the, the market hasn't necessarily reacted too strongly to that, if only because it looks like there was no foul play involved and they got an absolutely insane, um, Phil Flynn, he's a price analyst over at price futures group. You know, he doesn't expect much change relative to Iranian oil policy after the president's, um, death. You know, the only other two things I saw in the finance markets today, guys, uh, this actually happened on a two or on Monday, um, late in the afternoon. Apache announces seven hundred million dollars in two separate transactions um, related to some non-core assets that they had. The first up was some Midland Basin, uh, about 24,000 net royalty acres uh, spread across uh, Midland Basin. These are actually some minerals that they owned in aggregate. I uh, did about two, you know, about 2,000 barrels a day um, on, on, a, on, a, on a net assets, and these were uh, uh, mineral and royalty interests that were primarily non-operated interests. So they don't actually own the physical leases. Uh, on top of that, we also did see them divest about two 237,000 net acres um, in East Texas, both uh, some Eagle Fort and Austin Chalk with an effective date of January 1st, 2024. Um, net production on that's about 11,000 barrels of oil today. So overall, you're talking about 13,000 barrels of oil a day, uh, a third of that being oil. And you're talking about yeah, 53,000 flowing, you know, on a $700 million uh, total price. You're talking about that's a little over 53,000 per flowing BOE. Obviously, some of that there's there's PUD development on the upside. But man, 
Talk about a, uh, a you know, I, I don't have great things to say about Apache for a variety of reasons. I do know that this could be a great deal for them, considering it's non-core. And it's a pretty big price tag. You're talking about over, you know, even if you strip out, it's only about a third oil. So if we want to even get down to flowing barrel per oil price, absolutely unbelievable. Obviously, with some with with that net acreage getting or that acreage getting sold, there's going to be some some upside attached to it. But, you know, Wildfire Energy was on the other side of that transaction. It'll be very interesting to see how they develop it. They've been active recently over the past two years. Good for Apache going in, swooping that up. You know, we also saw Phillips 66. We don't really talk much midstream mergers and acquisitions, but Phillips 66 jumps in, acquires Pinnacle Midstream um, from uh, Dallas-based PE firm Energy Spectrum Capital. Um, quote out of there from Mark Lashner, chairman and CEO of Pinnacle 66. We are growing our midstream business in the permit to further strengthen and expand our service offerings to customers while driving operational and commercial synergies. We love a good word salad and a press release. Um, to give you guys an idea, it's an all-cash deal of about $550 million, um, get, uh, which gets access to um, um, the Dos Picos natural gas uh, processing system. There also is a few other things in there, but really the core of this asset is only about 80 miles of gathering pipeline, 50,000 dedicated acres. Um, um which is which is around 60 50 which sits on about 50,000 dedicated acres excuse me and about 220 million uh cubic uh, uh million cubic feet of gas per day processing plant so um they also believe they could scale another second 220 million uh cubic uh feet per day gas plant and and, and they claim integrates really well into the Philip 66 existing downstream infrastructure all I will say is this midstream we're gonna see a big booming 500 million dollar price tag for about 80 miles of, of gathering pipeline pretty good deal pretty good deal so I think it's going to be it's gonna be very interesting you know we've been saying this for a while um midstream if, if we're not building new pipelines, the, the pipelines that are in place are going to go for a premium. We're seeing that right here. Good for Energy Spectrum Capital, local Dallas company here, um, getting in on the action and selling out um, to Phillips 66. We, we'll see how this one plays out. Short show for me today, guys. That's really all I've got. As you're listening to this, please check out the episode seven for the deal spotlight. I, you know, I released that today with Bennett Williams, me and him sit down and talk Chevron Hess and Exxon swooping in and, and what's going on there. Highly recommend checking that out. You can check that out again in the description below, but I'm gonna let you guys get out of here. Start your day. We appreciate everybody checking us out here on the world's greatest uh, podcast, energy news beat. Check us out. www.energynewsbeat.com for Stuart Troy and Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow folks. Thank you.